Uh, okay, so let me just go to my first passage. So it's Easter, and usually this time we uh, remember what Jesus did for us. So um, today I'm going to preach about, because obviously you can uh, talk about different things during Easter, you can talk about the death, you can talk about the resurrection. Um, I want to talk about a topic that's probably not so familiar to most Christians, and that's the fact that Jesus Christ went to hell. He went to hell for three days and three nights before he resurrected. And a lot of people don't know this. Um, so the title of my sermon is Jesus Christ in Hell. So we're not saying that he's still in hell, right? But we're saying that when he died, where was he for three days and three nights? He was in hell according to the Bible. And then he rose again out of hell into, you know, this earth. And then, you know, he went to the Father and all these other things. So I know when most people hear that Jesus Christ went to hell, and when we go and preach the gospel, we do tell people. We tell them that, you know, he died on the cross, he was buried, he spent three days in hell, and then three days later he rose again. So we're not ashamed to let people know, and I think it's a good thing that people do know. But many people, when they first hear that Jesus Christ went to hell, they're a bit shocked at it. Right? And some people will just think like, oh, Jesus Christ went to hell? That's blasphemous. And they, and they might think that because they're, they're thinking that what we're saying is that Jesus Christ has his own sins to go to hell for. No, that's not what we're saying. So we're not saying Jesus Christ had his own sins that he needed to go to hell for. No, no, we're saying that he went to hell in order to pay for our sins. So while some people are shocked when they first learn about Jesus Christ going to hell and they think it's blasphemous, it's actually the opposite because if Jesus Christ did not go to hell, he didn't actually fulfill all the scriptures that are said about him. Now, when we read about the gospel here in 1 Corinthians 15, if, if you're ever wondering, where's the definition of the gospel in the Bible? Usually people go to 1 Corinthians 15 where Paul writes, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. So what does he mean by believed in vain? Vain, I believe he's talking about, unless you've believed the wrong thing, right? Because the whole chapter's about people not accepting that Jesus had risen again. Verse 3, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So then you ask, well, where is Jesus Christ going to hell in this, these verses here? Well, it's the fact that he died. So yes, we know that he died and that he rose again, but it's not just that he died and rose again. He died for our sins according to the scriptures. That's a very important phrase there because it's not just that Jesus died anyway. Right? It's not just that he was just, you know, what if Jesus was stoned? Is that the right way to die? No, because he had to be lifted up. He had to be whipped. There were certain things that had to happen in the Old Testament that he actually fulfilled in dying and being buried. And then it says he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So it's not just Jesus can just pay for our sins any old how. He has to pay for our sins according to the scriptures because he's fulfilling those prophecies. So whilst at first, hear me out, because I'm going to go through, I'm going to show you all the scriptures on why this is, and you'll see that it's very consistent. It's a very well-supported doctrine in the Bible. And like I said, many people are very shocked when they first learn about this. When I first learned about it, actually, it was quite refreshing to me in the sense that um, it made a lot of sense. Why? Because if, if we believe that if somebody does not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and they're going to be punished for their sins, what do we think the punishment is? We think the punishment is they die and their soul goes to hell for all eternity. So if I believe that's the punishment for my sins, if I don't have a saviour, why would it be so out of the box, so out of the blue, that I believe that if Jesus Christ takes my punishment for me, doesn't he then have to somehow suffer what I should have suffered? But if I have to suffer an eternity of hell, but Jesus just dies physically, how does that pay for an eternity of hell? If he, he never even graced the flames of hell, right? So that's why it made complete sense to me that when I learned this, I was like, oh, of course, that makes sense. Because if I should have gone to hell and Jesus Christ paid for my sins, it makes complete sense that he went to hell in my place. And therefore, he has paid for the punishment that I would have rightly deserved. So let's go through. I'm going to go through seven scriptural reasons to show that Jesus Christ went in hell. When you see how many scriptures there are really supporting this and, and going this, you'll be shocked that you never realized it to begin with if you didn't know this already. But we'll, first one we'll go to, we'll just go to the Psalms first. Because if you're reading through the Psalms, right, a lot of these Psalms are written by David. 
And you'll read psalms like this, like Psalms 18. We'll look at three psalms really quick. It says here, so this one's a psalm of David. You can uh, see here at the beginning, just a little intro to the chief musician, a psalm of David. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. So this is, this is David, right? A saved person talking to God. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. The sorrows of death compassed me, uh, compassed me and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. Look at this. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. Let's go to Psalm 86 and we'll see again another passage. So you, start, you kind of think, well, David is praying to God. David's, you know, he's obviously inspired to write these Psalms. Why is a saved person saying that hell is compassed about him? He says here, I will praise thee, O Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify thy name forevermore. For great is thy mercy towards me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. So did David go to hell? You know, he's saying the saved person, he's talking about God saving him from hell. I thought when we were saved, we never went to hell, right? Psalms 16. I'll show you another one here. David saying here, I've set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Right? Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. So you kind of think like, whoa, there are these Psalms written by a saved person, by David, but he's talking about being delivered from hell. So what, what do we make of this? Well, we don't have to wonder what we make of it, because in Acts 2, Peter, when he's preaching at the day of Pentecost, actually explains what these psalms mean, right? And what David is talking about. So on the day of Pentecost, if you remember, on the day of Pentecost, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. So they're preaching by the power of the Holy Ghost here. And Peter here preaching to the men of Israel, he says, You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you. As ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. So he's speaking about here the death and the resurrection. Now look at this here. Now he goes into the Psalms. He says, For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. So this is Psalm 16 that we, would, we just read. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life, thou, have, thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. So you see how he's quoting Psalm 16 there. And now he says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. So right, so he's, David's dead, his body did see corruption, his sepulchre's still there till this day. And uh, now he, David's in heaven. But he says, therefore, so now he's going to explain what the Psalms are talking about. Why is David talking about going to hell? He says, therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. So why then is David a saved man under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, talking about himself going to God? Well, it's explained here in Acts 2, very clearly saying because David was a prophet and because David knew that God had promised that of his loins, the Son of God would come of, you know, that's why Jesus is called the Son of David. Um, it says here that he, 
as a prophet, saw before the resurrection happened that the resurrection was going to happen. And he's prophesying of the death, burial and resurrection and seeing that Jesus Christ would go to hell in order to pay for our sins. Very clear there. I mean, we could just sort of close it there and just say, hey, this is as clear as day. The Bible's just telling us right, plain as the nose on our face, right? He's seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. So that's the first reason. The first reason is that you have the Psalms, and then you have the plain exposition of those Psalms by Peter the Apostle on the day of Pentecost, filled with the Holy Ghost, explaining what did it mean? David was talking about Jesus Christ going to hell and then rising from the dead, rising from hell, paying for our sins. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all Witnesses. All right, let's go on to the second reason. The second reason, we'll go to um, Isaiah 53, verse 3. This is a very a famous passage talking about Jesus being um, uh, beaten and bruised for our sins. We'll just read from verse 3. It says here, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. So this is just amazing that Isaiah was written many hundreds of years before Jesus Christ came. But if you read this passage to anyone, they will say, well, that's, that's talking about Jesus, right? And that's what the Ethiopian, if you remember in Acts 8, this is what the Ethiopian eunuch was, was reading as well. Um, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. So this is saying that Jesus went willingly, right, to the slaughter, to, to his death. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? That's interesting, right? Because, I mean, Jesus wasn't in prison, right? Like Jesus, he was judged and then he was crucified, right? So it's like, that's why I, I think now it's starting to get into the spiritual side. He was taken from prison, you know, because uh, hell is referred to as a prison, from judgment, right? Who shall declare his generation? Look at this. For he was cut off out of the land of the living, right? So where's that normally referring to? That's normally referring to hell, right? When we were cast off, right, out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken, right? He was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Look at this. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So first point was, Peter plainly preached, right? Second point is, Christ's soul was an offering for sin, not his body, right? His body was beaten, his body was buried, but the Bible says his soul was an offering for sin. Now, I don't know if you realize this when, when we read Ephesians 5. Look at what it says here in Ephesians 5. It says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also, also has loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering. Right? So was his body the offering? No, it was his soul was the offering. Right? But it says here, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savour. Now, that's an interesting passage. Now, you a lot of you weren't here for the Bible reading. You should have been here for the Bible reading. But well, we read through Leviticus 1 to 4. And I was saying I was going to refer back to it because when we read through Leviticus 1 to 4, what did you see? You saw an offering made by fire, a sweet savour unto the Lord. Right? Because what is that referring to? That's referring to the burnt offerings, the burnt sacrifice. When the burnt sacrifice is made, the Bible describes it as that, that smoke going up, that it's a sweet savour to the Lord. So isn't it interesting here that Christ is the offering? The Bible in Isaiah 53 says the soul is an offering, and he says here that he was an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savour. And it's not just through Leviticus. If you just type in sweet savour in, 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 in any Bible software, I just did that. The first one that comes up is in um, Genesis 8. I'll just show you here. This is Noah offering. I just thought it was interesting because it actually uses that, that 
similar phrasing. It says here, Noah built an ark unto the Lord. So this is after he came out of the, the ark of the flood. And took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the, look at this, and the Lord smelled a sweet savour. See, so in Ephesians it's a sweet smelling savour. This is the Lord smelled a sweet savour. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. So you see here, this, this burnt offering, this offering made by fire is a sweet smelling savour. Christ's soul was the offering. And that's why when he went to hell, it's another reason why we believe he went to hell. So Peter preached it. His soul uh, was the offering for sin. Uh, not just his body, right? Obviously his body, like in Isaiah 53 we read, it was beaten, it was bruised. It, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all, but the Bible says he bare our sins in his own body on the tree. And that's why he went to hell to pay for those sins. And three days later he rose again. Let's look at another, uh, another uh, scriptural reason for why we believe Jesus Christ suffered in hell for our sins. Um, 1 Corinthians 5, 6, it says here, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. So the Bible is saying here that Jesus Christ is our Passover. We no longer celebrate the Passover, right? If the, part, the, the Lord's Supper, or as people refer to it, the communion, the breaking of bread, this is not a continuation of the Passover. A lot of people teach that, and I believe it's just, I don't know if it's reform theology or what, but people just have this idea that things are just carried on from the Old Testament, like, like baptism is the new circumcision, Re uh, Re reform theology teaches that, they teach that the Sunday is the new Sabbath, and then when you start like making these connections that aren't there, you start, you start teaching things about the New Testament ordinances using Old Testament ordinances when there shouldn't even be any connection. So people will say like, oh that's why you know the Lord's Supper, you know the communion should be done in people's houses because the Passover was done in people's houses. This is why the, you, know, you do the Lord's Supper once a year because the Passover was done once a year. This is drawing a line where it shouldn't be, right? Because the line is drawn here where we say, how do we connect the Jewish Passover to what we actually do in the New Testament. Whereas explaining here, it says, Your glorying is not good. Know ye that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump, talking about the church. He says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. Right? So what's the unleavened bread in the New Testament? It's the church. Right? The church is meant to be the unleavened bread. And that's why in 1 Corinthians 5, it talks about certain sins not allowed at church, because it's about purging out that leaven out of the church. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Is it saying keep the Passover? Keep, you know, sacrificing and pouring out the lamb, putting it on the doorpost, those sort of things, and eating unleavened bread? No, it says, therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So we don't actually keep the feast by eating unleavened bread. We keep the feast by being as a church, unleavened bread, and Christ is our Passover. Breaking of bread, which is what we're going to do after before we eat, that has nothing to do with the Passover, right? This is just a new ordinance. You know, yes, some people use unleavened bread and unleavened wine, but it has nothing to do with keeping of the Passover. That's why, you know, um, breaking of bread can be done multiple times a year. It can be done any time, right? Some, people, some churches do it weekly. Some churches do it monthly. Some churches do it, you know, yearly. You know, it doesn't really matter how that's all. It's up to them how, how frequently they do it. So even on Friday, you know, when we had a lamb on the spit, that wasn't the keeping of the Passover. We're not keeping the Passover, you know, we didn't sacrifice any lambs. I just think it's cool, you know, just to have a lamb because we can remember that Jesus Christ died for us, you know, he went to hell for us. And, uh, and as we, at least the meal that we're having has some sort of significance in something that we can, we, we can remember. So here in 1 Corinthians 5, we learn that Jesus Christ is our Passover. Now if we go to Exodus 12, Exodus 12. Exodus 12 is when the Passover was given to the nation of Israel at, before they were uh, coming out of Egypt. So in Exodus 12 we read here, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months, it shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbour next unto his house take it according 
to the number of the souls, every man according to his eating, shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. So isn't that interesting? I didn't know if you know that, right? So it, for the Passover, they could do a sheep or a goat, right? Um, but it had to be a male. Right? So I can't remember whether ours was a male or not. I think Tony thought it was a male <laughs> as well. <laughs> uh, you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts, on the upper door posts of the houses wherein thou shalt, they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. So you remember the Passover lamb, they slaughtered on the evening of the 14th, right? And then they put the blood on the doorposts because why? The last plague that God sent to Egypt was the angel of death. And if there was no blood on the doorpost, then the firstborn in that house would die. Firstborn, if, if you don't know, it was firstborn of everyone. It was even the firstborn of cattle as well. Like every firstborn died, right? So obviously the Egyptians didn't do it, so they lost all their firstborn. And even the, the Israelites that didn't do it, they would have lost their firstborn as well. And that's why it's called the Passover, right? Because when God saw the blood on the doorpost, he would pass over that house. That's why it's referred to as the Passover. Verse 8. So it's interesting here that the Passover is roasted with fire. Verse 9, look at this. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water. So he's saying don't eat it raw, don't, don't uh, boil it, but roast with fire, his head, with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. Now why, if Jesus Christ is our pastor, isn't it interesting that when we go to the Passover, it's not just they just killed a lamb and they just ate it, because they killed a lamb, they ate it, but God was very specific to say, when you kill this lamb and you eat it, you must roast it with fire. You know, don't cook it on a, you know, don't cook it on a pan, don't boil it, don't eat it raw, roast it with fire, and if there's anything left until the morning, that you have to burn with fire too. Isn't that interesting, right? So I believe it's because it's pointing to the fact that Jesus Christ was burned out. Jesus Christ was the offering, the burnt offering for sin. His soul was the offering and he went to hell in order to pay for those sins. Um, and, and that's why there's this specific example where Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb. And when we look at the Passover in Exodus 12, it's, it's clear instruction saying that the Passover must be burnt with fire. Um, let's go on to the fourth reason. Uh, this one's a bit quicker, in Ephesians 4, 7. But in Ephesians 4, uh, we read about the death and resurrection of Christ, the descension and ascension of Jesus Christ. It says here, But unto every one of us is grace given, is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, right, so that's when Jesus Christ rose and went up back into heaven, he led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. So in Ephesians 4 it says here that Jesus Christ, he not only ascended up on high, but before that it said he first descended into the lower parts of the earth. Right? So again, a reference to the fact that he not only his body was buried, but his soul descended into the lower parts of the earth where hell is. So that's number four. Let's look at uh, number five. So number five, we're going to go to Matthew. Matthew 12, verse 38. Matthew 12, verse 38 is the sign of Jonah the prophet. It says here, Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, but there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, look at this, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. See, so when Jesus Christ died, his body, he, he, he died, his body was buried. Where was he for three days and three nights? Well, according to Jesus, Jonah was a sign that like he was in the whale's belly for three days and three nights, for the three days and three nights, Jesus was going to be in the heart of the earth. What's in the heart of the earth? It's hell, right? And we don't, and we don't know. And what's, what's interesting about this, even when we go to Jonah, like, this is so crazy. 
like just how consistent and just how like how, how like how evident this is in the Bible. Um, I'll just show you in uh, in, in chapter one where it tells us that Jonah was in, it says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So that's what Jesus is referring to when he says, like Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale of the belly, uh, in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. Now look here, when Jonah is in the welly, uh, in, the, in, the welly, in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, Look at what he says here in Jonah chapter 2. He says, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about, and thy billows and thy waves passed over me. I just want you to... Keep in mind this, 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 this thing, obviously he's in the sea, right? And he's, 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 he's um, sort of uh, uh, likening the waves and the billows as hell, right? Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about even to the soul, right? The soul was made an offering for sin, remember? The depth closed me round about, the weeds were wrapped about my head. A lot of people think that's referring to the crown of thorns. I went down to the bottom of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Right? So Jonah in the belly of the whale, in wherever he was in the sea, but when he's prophesying out of the belly of the whale, he's saying, I cried out of hell. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet thou hast brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. So again, we, see, we go to Jonah. Jonah was a sign to the unbelieving Jews, right? Saying, as Jonah was in the uh, belly of the well three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. We go to Jonah, and then Jonah is prophesying, like David was, saying, out of the belly of hell cried I. I just want to show you Psalm 88. And we'll just read through this. I'm not going to stop and really explain it, but I just want to, I just want to read through this. And just as, you, as we read through Psalm 88, just keep what we read in Jonah 2 in mind, because it's just there's such a parallel here. It says, O oh Lord, Lord God of my salvation, I cried day and night before thee. Let my prayer come before thee, incline thine ear unto my cry. For my soul is full of troubles, and my life draweth nigh unto the grave. I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that hath no strength. Free among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more, and they are cut off from thy hand. Thou hast ma laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the deeps. Look at this. Thy wrath lieth hard upon me, and thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves. Selah. Thou hast put away mine acquaintance far from me. Thou hast made me an abomination unto them. I am shut up and I cannot come forth. Mine eye mourneth by reason of affliction. You remember Jonah said that? By reason of my affliction. Lord, I have called daily upon thee. I have stretched out my hands unto thee. Wilt thou show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise thee? Shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave or thy faithfulness in destruction? Just keep that in mind, right? Where he says, shall the dead arise and praise thee. Shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave or thy faithfulness in destruction? And I'll, I'll, t I'll talk about that a bit later. Shall thy wonders be known in the dark and thy righteousness in the land of the forgetful? So what is he saying? Are people in hell going to hear of your marvelous works? Are they going to hear preaching there? But unto thee have I cried, O Lord, and in the morning shall my prayer prevent thee. Lord, why casteth thou off my soul? Why hidest thou thy face from me? Right? Think about this. Why hast thou, thou forsaken me? Jesus said that as well. I am afflicted and ready to die from my youth up while I suffer thy terrors. I am distracted. Thy fierce wrath goeth over me. Thy terrors have cut me off. Right? So it sounds like, sounds like whoever this is, who's talking about praying to God, right? He's suffering the wrath and terrors of God in hell. They came round about me daily like water. They compassed me about together. Lover and friend hast thou put far from me and mine acquaintance into darkness. Isn't that interesting? That, that's like a, somebody that's suffering in hell, yet it's somebody that God is, um, that, that uh, is, uh, his prayers are going unto God. So when you sort of read that with Jonah 2, there's a lot of similarities there. I just wanted to go quickly to 1 Peter, 
So I think this is interesting here, because there's a passage here in 1 Peter 18 referring to the death, burial, and resurrection, where it says here, For Christ also has, also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure, whereunto even baptism, also doth, now, doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So his baptism doesn't wash away our sins. Uh, the Bible says here it's just a figure of the death, burial, and resurrection. That's how baptism saves us, not the fact that the water washes away our sins, but it's the answer of a good conscience toward God. I just think it's interesting here. People dispute over what this means in verse 19, by, where it says, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. What is that referring to? I believe it's referring to the fact, like we read the Psalms, we read Psalm 88, where Jesus, he went to hell, right? And he's, he's praying unto God. But I think it's interesting here when we look at Psalm 88, and that's why I sort of pointed it out. It says here, Shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave, or thy faithfulness in destruction? Shall thy wonders be known in the dark, and thy righteousness in the land of the forgetful? Because I believe what's happening here is that when Jesus Christ went to hell, he's preaching the things that we read about in Psalms. And this is how the people, the spirits in prison, right, the people that are burning in hell, hear of God's righteousness, hear of his grace, because he's not going to leave Jesus Christ's soul in hell. That's what I believe that's referring to, if you're ever wondering what First Peter refers to. So, let's look at two more. So number five was Jonah the prophet. Number six, let's go to Revelation. We're almost there. Number six. Number six, we're going to read here from uh, Revelation um, 1, verse 13. And this is Jesus Christ talking here. It says in the midst, uh, talking about Jesus Christ here. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shining in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. And look at this. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. So Jesus Christ, we know this is Jesus Christ talking here. Because he says here, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Right? So Jesus Christ, he was alive, he came to this earth. He died for our sins, and then he rose again. Now what I want you to get you to think about is if we sort of compare this to John 11, 25, see Jesus Christ died according to the scriptures. Jesus Christ was dead, and behold, he is alive forevermore and has the keys of death and hell. But Jesus says here in John 11, he says, Jesus, sa Jesus saith unto, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die, believest thou this. So the question is, if the, when Jesus says, I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, it's just referring to the physical death, but all of us physically die, right? But the people that actually die are the ones that go to hell, right? Because we, according to the Bible, if we believe in him, we shall never die. So yes, we have the physical death, but Jesus didn't just suffer the physical death. It wasn't just the spirit separating from the body, because for him to truly die and rise again, he had to descend into hell. That's why we can say we never die, right? Because even though we physically die, our spirit leaves our body, our spirit and soul leave our body, and our body is now lifeless, we go on to live in heaven. We shall never die. But somebody that actually dies goes to hell. Jesus Christ said here, he, I am the, um, in, uh, sorry, in Revelation. He says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I'll just share one last one with you. This is kind of like a bonus one. But this is from Matthew 16. Matthew 16, it says here, And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, uh, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell 
shall not prevail against it. Now, I know Catholics love this passage, and I'm already talking about how Catholics interpret this passage, but um, the way we interpret it is not, the rock isn't Peter, right? Jesus is not building his church on a man, right? That just wouldn't make sense at all. Jesus Christ is the rock. So when he says um, that thou art Peter and upon this rock, what is he referring to? He's referring to the fact that Peter said to him, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, right? So he says, thou art Peter, right? And upon this rock, the fact that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God, he's going to build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's the only rock. I mean, why would you build your church on a man? How is that a rock and something to build you know, your church upon? But anyway, so he says here, upon this rock. So the rock that it's referring to is Jesus Christ. That's the rock that the church is built on. And what it's interesting here, it says here, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, the way I've always heard this verse preached, it's basically like, they'll say like gates are like a defensive structure. And they'll say like, when it says, I'll build my, uh, on this, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates, shall, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. They will say that the it is referring to the church because the church is going to storm the gates of hell. And, you know, we're going to storm the gates of hell and the gates of hell are not going to prevail against us. We're going to storm through it and we're going to, you know, we're going to storm through hell's minions, right? And take on Satan and all that sort of stuff. Now that all sounds good, and that all sounds like it came out of Diablo game, right? Where you know you're like this, this hero, right? you're storming the gates of hell. But that's not biblical at all, right? Because gates, yes, can be defensive, but gates also are like a prison, right? If you think about the prison gates, right? Keeping prisoners in. And why I don't think it's the church storming the gates of hell is one, why would we be running into hell? As believers, that doesn't make sense at all. I'm going to storm the gates of hell and throw myself into hell to fight hell's minions. The other thing that it doesn't make sense as well is hell doesn't have minions that we're fighting against, right? Hell is a place of punishment. It's a place of torment. It's God's judgment and prison where he punishes people. So people might get this idea. They, they probably get this idea from playing too many games, right? That's, that's where I got the idea from, playing games like Diablo, Diablo 2, yeah, Diablo, I never played Diablo 3, but I know Diablo 3 came out. But I think that's where people get this idea. But this idea, you look through the Bible, look up all the references of hell, there's no like Satan and his minions coming out of hell and we have to battle them like Lord of the Rings, you know, and the church is going to, you know, the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. No, no, no. When, when, whenever you, in Revelation, right, there are minions that come out of hell, but guess who they're attacking? Unbelievers. Right? Because the believers are, are spared from that. Right? He says, you know, we'll seal the servants of God in our forehead. So there are minions that come out of hell, but the, the minions that are coming out of hell are tormenting unbelievers because that's what they're doing in hell. The only one that came out of hell besides Jesus right, is Satan. Satan came out of hell, but he didn't bring any minions with him because right? when you read in Revelation, he came out of hell and he went to deceive the nations. He gathered his forces from the earth. And then they went to go battle against Jesus Christ. So he's not, he's not bringing any of his minions out from hell, right? I guess maybe we think of it as, you know, maybe the, the Satan and his demons. But remember, they're not in hell yet. And when they get thrown in hell, they're going to stay in hell. So again, maybe we get this false idea because Satan, we think, is ruling in hell and he has his demons and they're, they're in hell prodding everyone and he can just get his demons to come in and out of hell whenever he wants to go torment people. No, the demons and devils are on the earth. Right? These are angels that have sinned against God and they are going about doing their thing. But they have not gone to hell yet. When they get cast into hell, Satan comes out uh, at the end times. But there's not this idea here. So what do I think this is talking about? What I think this is talking about is the fact that Jesus Christ went to hell and it's saying that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, meaning that the gates of hell can't keep Jesus in. And I think... And, 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 I think it's supported, if we go all the way back to Acts, when uh, Peter was preaching, if you remember, this is where uh, Peter plainly said that Christ's soul was not left in hell. But if you remember here in Acts 2.24, it says here, Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. So I think there's a reference there to the fact that the rock is what the church is built on and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the rock in the sense that the rock cannot be held in hell because God or Jesus Christ is going to overcome hell and he's going to rise again from the dead. 
So anyways, I hope that was interesting. So just going over those seven reasons. So it's plainly preached by Peter. Christ's soul was the offering, not just his body. We see the clear instruction for the Passover lamb. Christ was our Passover, and the Passover lamb was specifically said to be burnt, and anything that was left to be burnt. Ephesians 4 says that Christ descended first into the lower parts of the earth before he ascended. Number five is the sign of the prophet Jonah. And then we have Jonah crying out of the, of, of the, whale's, uh, of the whale's belly, saying out of the belly of hell, cried I. Revelation tells us, number six, that Christ was dead and then alive. So he actually died. And then number seven is, I believe, Matthew um, 16 is saying that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the rock because the rock went to hell, but he overcame death and hell. So in conclusion, just some closing thoughts, right? Number one is, I hope you can see now that it might be a bit shocking to think about at the beginning that Jesus Christ went to hell, but I hope now that it makes sense to you. We're not saying that Jesus Christ went to hell for his own sins. We're saying that Jesus Christ went to hell for our sins. And thank God that he did, right? It makes sense because if we deserve hell, it makes sense that Jesus Christ went to hell for us in order to pay for them. So it helps us understand again why we're saved from an eternity of hell. You know, it shows that Jesus Christ is an eternal being because a, a man that is finite cannot pay for an eternity of hell. But Jesus Christ, he went, I mean, he could have paid for an eternity of hell in an instant, right? Because he's infinite. But why did he stay there for three days and three nights? Was well, because it was fulfilling, right? He was fulfilling the scriptures. He died according to the scriptures. And part of the scriptures was that he would be in the, um, in the earth three days and three nights. And I think once we understand this as well, you know, if we get over the initial repulsion because we just haven't heard this preached before, I think it gives us a greater appreciation, right, for God's love because we have a greater understanding of what Jesus Christ actually did for us. And in 1 John 3.16, you know, we have John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But in 1 John 3.16, we read here, it says here, Hereby perceive we, or we understand, right? We perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us. So when we understand that Jesus Christ went to hell, we have a greater understanding of what it means that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. You know, yes, it wasn't that it was just a painless death. Yeah, he suffered, he was bruised, he was whipped. But not only that, his soul descended into hell and he suffered the wrath of God in our place. It says here, we, we perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So if we have a greater appreciation of Christ's love for us, hopefully that spurs you on to, to love others as Christ has, has loved us because that's what the Bible says. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord. We thank you for your word. Um, Lord, this is just uh, such a clear doctrine throughout the Bible. And we just thank you, Lord, for what Jesus did for us. You know, sometimes we just thought that the, the, the death and the suffering was enough. But now we understand, Lord, that you, you not only did the physical uh, fulfillment, but you also did the spiritual fulfillment. We thank you, Lord that you did all that for us, that because of that we have hope, we have a place in heaven, and we just praise you, Lord, for your greatness and for your mercy, for your love, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.